Our guest video today is by Knowledge Bolide crew member Daniel Shake. Daniel is a meteorite researcher and PhD student in cosmochemistry attending Portland State University. As of March 2023, Daniel has 253 approved classifications published in the Meteorological Bulletin database and specializes in lunars. In today's video, Daniel takes a look at four different lunar thin sections and describes what he sees in them from a scientific point of view and how he uses them for classifying meteorites. If you want to learn more about thin sections, feel free to search my channel for thin sections. Please do me a favor and subscribe to Daniel Shake's YouTube channel. I'd sure appreciate it. Welcome one, welcome all. Daniel Shake here. Today we're going to be talking about Lunar Meteorite Thin Sections, Part 1. I classify meteorites all the time, and my particular focus is on lunar meteorites, mainly because they pertain to my research, of course, and trying to understand uh, the evolution of the lunar interior, and of course, the effects of uh, shocks, shock effects on lunar meteorites from impacts. So let's look at a few uh, lunar meteorite thin sections and try to get a sense of what's really going on here. So this is the first sample we're going to look at. Now, the key thing to know with thin sections are that it's very easy to get caught up in the finer details, but it's important to have a sense of the big picture in terms of what the sample is. So this is a lunar meteorite. All of the samples I'll be showing are lunar meteorites. But the key thing to know from this one is, first, note that when you're looking at it, you have all these class boundaries here. In fact, you tend to see these larger class boundaries encompassing smaller class boundaries. That's very typical of most of our lunar uh, brecciated rocks, primarily because these are, of course, breccias due to many repeated impacts on the surface of the moon that mix material and turn bigger rocks into smaller rocks that can incorporate into other rocks. And we tend to call this fractal, which just means a rock in a rock. So of course, these are our fragmental breccias, but primarily this is a feldspathic rich meteorite just because it contains a lot of feldspar. You can sort of see uh, some of these, uh, more of the crystalline feldspars, larger grains, but of course, you can have more of the amorphous feldspar in, in terms of mescalonite or other uh, potential phases. The key thing to note here is that you have these larger class, but it's not so uh, discernible unless, of course, you look closer and you notice that there are smaller classes here. So pretty large class. I mean, this is, you know, if you were to look at this enhanced specimen, you'd probably see uh, centimeter-sized clasts, and you think this is just one thing, but you'll notice when we look at it here, there are many smaller subdivided class, so it's not so simple as what it appears to be. You also have this smaller class here. This looks to be rich in main phases, so primarily probably olivine or pyroxene. looks more like olivine. So if this is feldspar, then that's more of a coarser size, and essentially we've got some sort of troctolite, possibly, or more of an olivine norite if there's pyroxene. So, of course, you know, there's always going to be a variety of fate of class types of lunar meteorites. And primarily a large part of what I like to do is look for unusual class pathologies because, you know, there's always rocks from the moon that we haven't sampled yet. And they can tell us a lot about how the moon formed and evolved over time. So that's a pretty cool part of my research. And I always try to keep a lookout for anything unusual whenever I see thin sections. So in this one in particular, I'm going to say this is probably a just a typical lunar feldspathic breccia, probably more of a fragmental than a melt breccia, just because it seems like a good amount of the matrix is uh, primarily composed of smaller uh, fragments, more so than melt, although there are melt areas here. So perhaps I'd come back to this at a later time to discuss this in more detail, but definitely seems like a pretty cool, more, more of your typical type of lunar meteorite you find. Now, this is more of a very unusual type of lunar meteorite. You don't really see these very often, and this is what we call a lunar gabbro. So these are coarse grain rocks that form primarily underground, so they plutonic in origin, so below the surface from magmas that crystallize. And because of how large the grain sizes are, we can infer that they cool relatively slowly and are likely for the most part unzoned, although there is you know, slight zonation across different grains, but for the most part, relatively equilibrated in composition. So of course, you can see all of them. This is this blue phase right here. You have these pyroxenes, looks like pigeonite phases, probably are trending into uh, high calcium pyroxene as well. And then uh, you have Plagioclase clay feldspar. You can see it's these phase right here in some places. It's sometimes a little difficult because when you have low calcium pyroxene, you can kind of mix it up with 
uh, plagic clays, unless you really look close and you observe the uh, intersection of the cleavage planes to see if it's 90 degrees or you know different. But of course, this sample has been shocked, and you can see fracture planes, so it you know makes it a little more difficult. It's always easier when you just you know put this in and take a chemical map, and you can you know right away see where the aluminum is, where the calcium is, and you can determine like that what the mineral phases are. But thin sections are always great because you get a firsthand view of the texture, the grain size, and you can kind of get a sense of where the important areas are to sample. So you might say, well, this is a pretty cool grain. Maybe it's olivine. So let me take a point right here, take a point right here of this likely pigeonite or whatever Pearson phase it is. And then you can find more representative points of where to hit if you're ever doing analysis. So yeah, this is a lunar gebrel and a very interesting specimen uh, to have. So quite different from the last one we saw. But you can imagine if you took this and you notice that it's also relatively unbrecciated, which is pretty rare in most lunar samples to have unbrecciated material. It's very pristine, if you want to note that, although it is been affected by shock. You know, you can see these fracture planes running through it. So it's been affected by that. But if you can imagine if you took this rock and you broke it up into, you know, many thousands of pieces and you incorporated this small fragment in, you know, the previous sample, like let's say something like this, then of course, you know, it's obvious that uh well, it makes it much more difficult, sorry, per se, that this actually came from that. So it's always nice when you have pristine samples because you can sort of identify right away, okay, this is this. Whereas when you see this and you see this fragment, you can say, well, its composition is similar to this, but did it actually form that way? Or, you know, what else could it have formed by? So it, it's always nicer when you have unbrecciated material. However, going back to a more uh, brecciated lunar meteorite, this third one, we can see right away there are a lot of clasps. So different from the first one in that you don't have those larger clasps with the smaller clasps in them that are harder to discern the boundaries. Here you can clearly see we have a lot of clasps in a fine grain matrix, probably approaching maybe more of a melt matrix. Uh, a bit hard to say, really. Uh, I had to look closer on the grain size of the matrix, but clearly it's a fragmental breccia. You have all these fragments in this uh, matrix. And the reason I'm including this is you can notice that some of these uh, lithologies appear different. If you want to look at the colors, you see here, this one's very rich in feldspar, but you see this one has a uh, pigeonite pyroxene sort of making these little, uh, you know, areas right here. And they sort of connect. That's very interesting. We call this more of a poikilitic texture. Uh, and then, of course, we have the, uh, the ever so famous dunite class that I spoke about at the recent Meteorological Society annual meeting. Uh, this is the largest class in the sample, and it's very unique in that it likely could either come from the mantle or from a lower crustal source. But of course, almost completely composed of olivine, you can see these very colorful, uh, you know, grains right here. And then, of course, you have these, you know, classes right here, which are probably almost completely made up of feldspar, maybe some pyroxene in there. But yeah, so more of there, especially like this, this looks like more of an anorthosidic type mineral class, probably just feldspar grains that were just broken off. And then here are probably some pyroxenes that were broken off. So whenever you see these, of course, every single grain or every single class can come from a completely different part of the moon. And it's very difficult when you're trying to understand how this thing came together and formed. So, but that's the, that's the cool part about lunar meteorites because you can always get lucky. You know, whenever you take a slice for a thin section of some lunar meteorite, you could potentially sample a very unusual class that you haven't sampled before, and that can tell you a lot about how it forms. So just imagine this dunite class likely came from, you know, some sort of magma chamber that contained other dunite class. And you can imagine if they were all stuck together, it would sort of resemble something of the previous sample, except there'd be all, you know, olivine grains together. But because it was broken up and likely distributed, you know, and fractured, this is kind of the only remaining evidence that we have of that particular, you know, rock wherever it formed so far. So always cool to at least have pieces of it that you can still study. But then, of course, you run into questions about whether the grain size is really relative to what it should be in terms of its actual size and whether the modal mineralogy is true to it. But in this case, it's all olivine, so I don't think that's a big problem there. And finally, this is uh, my most recent lunar meter that I classified. This is a lunar dimic breccia. So dimic means two. So you have two different lithologies present. And this is the one that I have submitted an abstract for for the Lunar, Lunar and Planetary Science Conference. And I'm not going to spoil anything interesting about it, but it does have a very unusual uh, lithology in it called pink spinel anorthosite, which you can't really see in 
this view of transmitted light cross polarized light but uh, if I were to show a different type of map, you'd be able to see them. That's just because the spinel grains, uh, they go extinct uh, when you put in the cross polarized light. But pretty much, you can see there's two lithologies here. It's almost like if you drew a boundary here, you could sort of map out where one transitions to the other. And you can see right away there's distinct differences. So the one on the right is fragmental. So you've got these large fragments of minerals like olivine, pyroxene, and plagioclase stuck in this sort of fine grain, almost melted matrix. And on the left, you have a completely, for the most part, uh, crystallized matrix from a melt. So it's very igneous in origin, like there's some impact melt that crystallized, but it's got some clasts in here. You know, it's hard to see on this map, but some small clasts. So the main idea is that you probably had a uh, initial parent rock or target rock like this that was struck by an impactor, melted, crystallized to form this, and then whatever didn't melt just was in, uh, sort of entrained as classed in this uh, crystallizing melt. And it probably crystallized feldspar first, given the grain size, and that the feldspar mostly is unzoned. Although the olivine that is in here is tinier, and it is zoned. So probably you, uh, on the, you know, on a crystallization sequence, you probably go plagioclase, and then you probably go olivine as soon as you start uh, along that plagioclase, olivine cotactic, maybe a little further down the line, uh, you start, uh, the cooling rate probably speeds up. Maybe you exhume this material or something, and th then you get these larger feldspar lats, but you get smaller olivine grains that are zoned. So I don't know. I'm still you know thinking about how this could have came together, but the two are definitely genetically related. So that's the the key thing to note here. Anyways, that's uh, four lunar meteorites uh, that I've looked at in thin section, and of course I have many more lunar meteorites and many other type of meteorites that I get all the time uh, for classification purposes. So if you want your meteorites to be shown at this section and me to talk about it, uh, please contact me and I provide classification services of meteorites. And of course, I'm always interested in any kind of lunar meteorite for either research purposes or just uh, to do uh, basic classification. I really like to focus on class lithology. So I look in the finer details of lunar meteorites. So Maybe I'll take a while to study it, but if there's any unusual material in there, then you'll be 100% sure that I will look at that. So anyways, that's everything. Thanks for watching and uh, stay tuned.